This is from Matthew 22, beginning at the 34th verse. When the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had left the Sadducees speechless, they met together. One of them, a legal expert, tested him and said to him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I feel like you've moved further away over here. I'm sorry. I hope that's not an indication of what the questions may be like this morning. So. Uh, we're thrilled again to come back together and have this time of holy conversation. You've submitted uh, questions, and we're going to attempt to address those. And, you know, one of the things that we're very aware of is that this is really more or less the beginning of a conversation. We're not going to answer everything today. Uh, we're not going to resolve everything today. Uh, and so in many respects, if we can do nothing more than just get some conversation started today, uh, then we believe that that will have been beneficial. So the first couple of questions um, deal somewhat with the same thing, and that is um, the question sort of around who is our neighbor, mm -hmm. and how do you want to begin to phrase that conversation? Because I think that's essential, and the whole of the conversation is beginning to think about right. who our neighbor is. So, um, you know, the word neighbor means near, and so very often we think that nearness is geographic only, right? So my neighbor is the person that's near me. Uh, and the reality of it is, I think in the, in the sense of, of God's kingdom, uh, that neighborliness is how we draw near to people. And so uh, neighbors are people that I am not simply geographically close to. Neighbors are people that I need to draw near to. I think that is the invitation of God is to draw near to people. Um, during the, uh, one of the series, I think it was earlier in the month, we sang this great hymn that's in our hymn book that's actually from Africa called Yesu, Yesu. And it reminds us in that hymn that neighbors are rich and are poor, neighbors are black and are white, neighbors are near and are far away. Uh, our neighbors are people, human beings just like us. And neighborliness is drawing near to others particularly drawing near to those people who are different than us. And so some of the continued conversation about neighbor is I think some of the struggle that we have um, in neighbors that are really close to us. And so it's um, one of the questions um, from a child in our community is can I um, truly love my neighbor if I hardly ever see them? <laughs> and I've only seen my new neighbors when they moved in. Um, what should I be doing? And I think some of the struggle is that in our neighborhoods, the way that we build them these days, you know, with alleys in the back, and we, we a lot of times don't know the people who live the very closest to us. Now, I know some of y'all live in Frisco Lakes, and I think it's a whole different thing in Frisco Lakes because um, everybody there seems to have sort of that knowledge of when their neighbors are coming and going. But I will tell you, part of that is that the driveways are in the front. And for those of us who live more in these places where the alleys and the driveways, we sneak into our houses and we sneak out and we really don't know our neighbors that well. And yet there's this invitation of how do we do that in a world where we tend to close the door, lock the door, put no solicit signs on the door all the times. And so y'all, people just even knocking on the doors, I won't ask y'all, but if somebody just comes and knocks on your door at a time when you don't expect it, I know a lot of y'all look out the window, sort of see, do I know that car or not? And a lot of you don't ever answer the door. Maybe. Maybe it's just me. But I know a lot of you don't. So. Yeah. So part of what I would say is that one of the things I've learned, if you want to meet your neighbors who are the ones that are geographically living in your neighborhood, I invite you to go out early in the morning when it's cool and late in the evening, right before sunset, and go for a walk. Because in my neighborhood, I find dozens and dozens of people who are walking and it's just a great way to begin to meet some of them and walk alongside of them. 
Uh, sometimes I've had to sort of figure out my pattern because I walk around the park and uh, there's kind of a little path there and all my neighbors seem to be walking in a clockwise direction. I always seem to be walking in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, but I, I just really encourage you, that's where, that's where our neighbors are right now. And I'm always amazed when I drive home, uh, sometimes right before sunset, to see neighbors who are out in common space but they've been out for a walk and they're, they're now cloistered together and having conversation. Yeah, so we don't, we don't meet neighbors the way we used to. We don't meet them in their driveways. We don't necessarily meet them when we go knock on their doors, but we're out and, and usually in my neighborhood right now, it's early in the morning when people are walking or right before sunset, people are walking. How can I love my neighbor if they don't love me back or if they hate me? And then there's another one. How do you love others who hate you? Right. So, um, the scripture reminds us that we don't overcome evil with evil. We overcome evil with good. And, and I don't want to be too flippant about that, but I think, you know, our call is to love, not to get a response. I mean, that, part of what's implied in that question is that I can only love if somebody loves me back. And the reality of what we see, especially in the good news of Jesus Christ, is that Jesus loved even when people hated him even when people kill, were killing him and uh, torturing him, Jesus still loved them. And so our call and our command is not about what kind of response we get. Now look, I, we're human. I love to have response and I love to have people love me back. But in the toughest of our relationships, uh, the, the command from Christ is not to only love those who love you in return. It's to just keep on loving. And the belief is, because we believe that perfect love drives out fear, is that if we keep loving and keep loving and keep loving, even in the face of hate, eventually that love wins out. I think we can learn so much from people who um, have modeled this. And you talked right. about the model of Jesus in the midst of this. There's also um, people who have lived um, in more modern times. Um, Nelson Mandela is somebody who um, had just terrible injustice and oppression placed upon him. And yet when he rose to power and people said to him, you now have the ability to do to them what they did to you. That's not what he chose. He chose to continue to live in love and what that meant was he didn't receive a lot of love back immediately for that. Um, but he was consistent and faithful to that. Um, I think sometimes we have to lean into sort of looking at some other people who continue to teach us that as well. Because it's not easy. Um, we do tend to want that immediate response. We want that um, sense of which if we do something, and love often can be translated in the Bible to do good unto. If I do good unto somebody else, my thought is, surely they will do good back unto me. And that's not always the case. Um, God reaches out in love towards us all the time. We know how to love because God first loved us. And God reaches out to love towards us whether we are living fully in love with God or not. God's love continues. So does the love have to be active? I'm an introvert, so love my neighbor by doing mission work, donating, etc., but not so much in the social situations. I think the question is, is that enough? Does it have to be active too? Well, I think there's a lot of different ways to being active. I don't think activity is relegated to those who uh, are extroverted. For example, one of the great lost arts of our time is the ability to write somebody a handwritten note. I, I don't know of anyone uh, but especially an introvert that couldn't sit down and give encouragement to other people by writing them a note and to be able to communicate in that way. I think what we tend to do is we forget about the fact that um, uh, our God is a creative God and therefore our God oftentimes offers to us creative responses. So I, I don't think we can get to that place where we just align and say, well, I'm this, so I can't do this. 
Uh, we can be active in so many ways. God has created us. So if God has created you with a more introverted personality or a more shy personality, I promise you God still has ways for you to express love whether it's through handwritten notes or whether it's through art or through whatever, through it's some kind of, you know, private gift giving, whatever it is, there are ways for uh, everyone to be active in love. So how do I continue to love a neighbor who takes advantage of me without ending the relationship? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, the one thing I didn't say in the midst of the conversation about who is my neighbor mm -hmm. is uh, the fact is, is that sometimes we're placed in relationships with people um, that we just can't uh, completely push away from. So, one of the examples I give about that is that, you know, it, we, we live in a world now, it's really interesting with social media where you can unfriend people, right? And it sounds just so easy. And then it re dawned on me earlier this morning, that's like second grade. You're my best friend. And then tomorrow, I unfriend you. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what goes on on social media sometimes. And I, and I think that uh, um, we've got to realize that there are oftentimes deeper roots in all of our relationships. So one of the things that I said last night uh, that I really believe is true is that, you know, there are probably going to be people who have offended you at your Thanksgiving table this year. And you probably just don't have the option of unfriending them, right? You've got to learn how to work through that. And when they take advantage of you, what you've got to be careful of is not to retaliate and take advantage of them. Now, I do think that one of the things that we learn is that sometimes with people that we have troubled relationships with is that sometimes we have to set some parameters or what uh, uh, people sometimes refer to as boundaries, Right? None of us should ever put ourselves in a situation where we just allow somebody to hurt us and abuse us. That's not good. Uh, and that should be true in, in all of our relationships, particularly in terms of our families. You know, if there's somebody in your family that's hurting you, um, please uh, know that uh, that's a situation that shouldn't be tolerated. You know, that's not something that just should be okay because you're married to someone or because you're somebody's parent or you're somebody's child. Um, we don't believe that abuse should ha continue to, 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 to be carried on. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, you have to go back and figure out how do I continue to build bridges? How do I continue to live in healthy ways? And I think that's the real conversation. What does is, what is healthy love look like? And um, there are ways in which we very slowly and usually through a great deal of time and effort come back to places of forgiveness and reconciliation. God offers us unconditional love, but God also, in the midst of our free will and in the midst of reaching out to us in love, um, has offered us some sense of boundaries. Um, it's one of those where that's part of the great gift is about how do we really live in love with one another. We live in love with one another by also knowing that um, that is, is exactly what Billy said, that's supposed to be a healthy type of love. Um, how do we really establish some of that? And so somebody talked last night to me after the service, which I hope these conversations continue, talked with me about um, somebody in their family that they felt like just ongoing um, took over advantage and just continued to be hurtful and then was also harming, harming themselves. And they talked about how do I continue to love? Do I need to continue to say yes to everything? And I said, it may be about us figuring out what we can say yes to. And then also in the midst of that, being clear about what the boundaries are. Sometimes helping other, um, us live in healthy relationships with one another and with others is about how we establish some of those boundaries. And that's some of how we continue to live in the fullness of God's love. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 outlines some of what love is. Um, love is about being patient and kind, not insisting on our own way. But love is also not arrogant or rude. And so it's one of those where, you know, Paul wrote those 
1 Corinthians 13 wasn't written about a marriage relationship. It was written about people who were struggling and a church that was divided and about how we live in full relationship with one another. I think that that can be true in our relationships as well. And sometimes that means having some good, healthy boundaries also. Yeah, and I don't know if we're going to have questions here about um, Scripture, but I want to kind of jump into that conversation, (laughs) even if we don't have some of those uh, The scripture and our religion should never be used to oppress someone. Uh, It is wrong for someone to take advantage of you and then for them to come to you and say, the Bible says you have to forgive me. That's wrong. That's not the scripture. That may be the words of the scripture, but that's not the intention of the scripture. We should never allow somebody to project faith or the Bible onto us uh, it, it should never be used as a weapon. It should ne- never be used to control people. Uh, that's why I had trouble a few weeks ago when, there, when that statement came out. And I'm sorry, uh, but I mean, Attorney General Sessions was wrong when he s- quoted Romans 13 about, you should obey the government. That was out of context. And it was not the word of God in that moment. It was simply a way in which I want to control a group of people by using the Bible in this moment as a weapon. Anytime somebody uses the Bible against you as a weapon, it's not the Word of God. And in too many situations where we talk about advantage, somebody takes advantage of us and then what they say is, yeah, but you're a Christian, you have to forgive me. Or the Bible says you have to forgive me. That, that's not the Word of God as we understand it. And too often that begins to be that mic drop moment that you talked about last week where we throw out a scripture as sort of the final word and drop the mic and walk away, but we don't continue to be engaged in conversation about the fullness of what that means. And so here are some questions some about what's the divisiveness of our world. I am so angry at those who hurt others and yet claim to be Christians. How can I love racist bigots and anyone who is different? I really struggle. And then another question that follows is how should we respond to neighbors who use religion to advance partisan politics? So let me, let me take the first one um, in regards. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, first of all, it's real easy for us to sort of categorize a group of people and call them racist or call them bigots. I I think part of the struggle that we sometimes have is we do get to a place and we forget that, that, um, as you and I've had conversation before, sometimes our greatest bigotry is towards somebody that's prejudiced. All means all. And so how do you love somebody even in the midst, you know, God doesn't push those people away either. Now, Having said that, I think we have to get back to the source of some of that kind of bigotry. And I read something this week that really uh, just caught my attention. Um, And it has to do with the connection between bigotry and suffering. Okay, so Parker Palmer has written this great book, new, uh, called On the Brink of Everything. And he gave this commencement address. Some of y'all may have read uh, this this week. But I'm so struck by what he said in one of his points. He said... I urge you to remember that violence is what happens when we don't know what to do with our suffering. Sometimes we aim the violence at ourselves in, an, in, in overwork that leads to burnout and to various forms of abuse. And sometimes we aim our violence at other people. Racism, sexism, and homophobia often come from people trying to relieve their suffering by claiming their superiority over others. So when you come across somebody that is racist or homophobic or bigoted or sexist in whatever way, it's not going to be easy. And and you shouldn't just say, well, it's okay. If you want to have that belief, it's okay. It's not okay. And we should be willing to challenge that. But the question really is, what's the suffering that's underlying? Are we compassionate enough to try to understand where are you hurting? Right? You know, where are you hurting? I mean, when, when my ancestors would say racist things, I wish I'd had the capacity to be able to say, help me understand where the deep pain is coming from. Because you seem really 
really upset about this. But most all of the violence and the hatred and the bigotry in our world comes from an underlying current of suffering in somebody's life. And the question is, have we done enough to understand that suffering? And a lot of times in the midst of that suffering, there's fears yeah. that, they will, that that will come back again. And so if we can begin to rather than feeling like we've got to take a stand and protect um, our views and our beliefs and our systems and listen to one another, listen to one another's fears. Um, now again, we go back to that healthy boundary type thing, but to really listen to one another and to begin to um, not to always be thinking of, and y'all, this is hard. It's hard when we get these questions and we want to start, I'm already trying to think through what, what the next question is. But instead of me forming what I want to say next so that I can do the mic drop and walk away or post on Facebook and sign off, if I can listen and hear the heart of the other person. When we look at scripture, we look at it through the lens of tradition, reason, and experience. And we have no idea what other people's experience is most of the time. We don't know what has happened in their lives that has come to the place where they have those particular beliefs or feelings. And so first we have to listen to one another and then we have to continue to invite one another to live fully in love. And so one of the things that our church continues to struggle, not just Grace Avenue, but the broader United Methodist Church struggles with, and this person asks is how should our church respond to those from the LGBTQ plus community? Wow, it only took us four worship services to get to this question. I haven't had that question in any of the other services. Yeah, this is really crucial, very crucial for us right now. Uh, I, I want to start with a simple invitation. Um, in regards to the LGBT community, Q community, we need to quit talking about these people and start talking with these people. I want you to start in your private prayer time right now asking yourself the question, how much time am I spending talking about people and how much time am I talking with people? Every one of us, every one of us in this room knows somebody who is gay. And the question I have for every one of us is have we been willing to sit down and have a conversation that says, what would make you feel welcome? What do you need in your life? How could our church be more open to welcoming you? And begin to listen, just like we would with anybody of difference that, that's different from us. I think building bridges in these moments is so much more important than putting up obstacles. You remember a few weeks ago, we read the story about Jesus calling Levi, the tax collector, and one of the things that we were reminded of is that Jesus is in the obstacle removal business. And so I don't know any other way to say it other than I just think in the next few months, particularly as our denomination wades into the waters of how we are going to navigate and be more accepting and deal with some of these issues, we've got to quit thinking about our LGBTQ brothers and sisters as issues. I don't want to be called an issue, and they don't either. And so I just prayerfully, with all my heart, just ask you, if you don't do anything else in the next few months, regardless of where you think you stand on this issue, please spend as much time talking with people as you do talking about people. And so a follow-up question um, is about tolerance or acceptance. Um, God calls us to love one another. And so in loving one another, it really is about how do we sit down and begin to engage in relationship with. Um, that's not about tolerating. That's about how we really live fully in relationship with others. And so in terms of so many things in our community, and, and this person didn't write those, um, any particular things, but I think too often what we do is we lump people into groups. Mm -hmm. And we may say, okay, I can tolerate, 
there's something about beginning to get to know people. Right. Um, and so it's, that's why we felt like the Breaking Bread series was so important about how do we join together around table. Um, and I think that's gonna be the key. Um, the United Methodist Church has been talking about the LGBTQ plus um, community and inclusion and how we welcome one another and live together um, for over 30 years. Um, it's very much time for us to not be talking about, but talking with and know that we, we have faithful, faithful members of this community who are part of our church family. And I think the question that said was, how shall our church respond? My prayer is that Grace Avenue, regardless where the United Methodist Church is, will always be a place that welcomes all. And all, all. means all. I need to say in the midst of people clapping that um, I know that there's other people here who are struggling, who struggle. I mean, it, and that is their Christian heartfelt response too. It's that struggle of wanting so desperately to make sure that they are living into scripture as well and wanting to make sure that we, and so we need to acknowledge that for other people who, who didn't feel like that they could applaud, you need to know that all means all and that this, the table the Christian table is big enough for all of us to continue to have that conversation. Um, Y'all, there were, um, not too long ago, years ago, that I couldn't be sitting up here answering questions because of biblical scripture that says that women are to be quiet and silent. Some of you may want that to return. <laughs> but it's something we continue to deal with as we deal with scripture. <laughs> Billy sometimes might like that, but it's, well, <laughs> it is where we are, so. No, I, I mean, I guess I'd wanna interject one more thing there, and I think it's really important. I, you know, we need to get a new definition of tolerance. I'm not sure that we're just simply called to tolerance because we've all decided, I think, in our vocabulary now that tolerance simply means you do what you wanna do and I'll do what I wanna do. And let's try not to bother each other in the midst of that. That's, that doesn't seem to me to be the picture of the kingdom of God that no. Jesus painted. Jesus invited us to table together. Tolerance has got to be more than live and let live. And I don't know what exactly the language is, but it, it is about giving life and generating life. And, and, and I think that tolerance needs to be more than just, well, you have the freedom to do what you want and I have the freedom to do what I want. Yeah. And so this is our last question, and I think it's appropriate to kind of end with. The world is so filled with chaos, hate, anger. How do we even try to make a difference? And then this question, are we enough? Are we enough? Yeah, you know, sometimes I, I hate to be... Oh, gosh, I hate to be that trivial about it, but, you know, difference making just always starts one step at a time. It always starts one person at a time. Nobody says, I'm going to change the world, and they go out and put together a big plan, and then the world starts changing. They start by building a relationship, and then a network of relationships, and, the, you know, I mean... It, you can go on and on about these things, but they're so true. I mean, it's the old starfish story, right? You know, the guy on the beach and million, uh, thousands of starfish have washed on the beach and a um, guy comes along and he starts throwing them back in and this other person comes along and says, what are you doing? There's, there's thousands of, th you're not going to save them all. You're not going to make a difference to all of these starfish. They're all going to die before you can get to them. And he picks one up, throws it back and says, made a difference to that one. I mean, I just think that's really true. You know, you start with where you are. You know, Margaret Mead's quote about, you know, don't ever believe that a small group of committed, dedicated people can't change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, so I, I just think, you know, it, how we start one person at a time, connecting to one person at a time, and then, then you let the grace of God 
take over from there. Uh, I think, you know, we're not ultimately responsible for the results. We're responsible for faithfulness. And if I'm faithful tomorrow in a relationship and building a bridge towards someone, I'm going to trust that God's going to turn that into something of significance and of measure. But it's, it's not my job to measure the success. It's my job to be faithful one at a time. What was the second part of that question? Because I don't want to miss anything. Are we enough? Oh, yeah. I think so. Therefore, that's the whole point. We are enough. Yeah, absolutely. We're enough. And uh, um, it's interesting how that question is even phrased because the question is not, am I enough? No. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not enough, but we are enough. Mm -hmm. And then what is challenged in that is to say, what is our concept of we? How do we continue to build a larger table? Uh, John Polovitz has written a great book called A Bigger Table. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is that uh, building a bigger table where more and more people are included is the work of the kingdom of God, but it's really messy work. It's really time consuming. It's very messy to try to build a bigger table. But um, in that respect, yes, then we in the very best sense of the term, are enough. We inclusive of God's plans and God's grace and God's everything. So can I share a story? I would like for you to, I'm sorry, I was gonna, that was what I was gonna ask you to do because that's so, a great story about the collective we. And so um, Billy and I got to participate in that broader table this past weekend. And that is that on Friday evening, we drove down to Green, Texas. And on Saturday morning, we went to Green United Methodist Church, and we'd never met the pastor there, and he came and um, welcomed us, opened the doors for us to go and be with some of our church family members. Church family members who were down there for an entrustment service. Now, some of you may not know what an entrustment ceremony is, and Billy and I have gotten the opportunity to Um, be involved in now several of those. Because what we did was we gathered with a birth mom who came and with the family from our church who was adopting a little boy. And throughout the morning, as family in a bigger table, we shared in a service of blessing. Blessing of this birth mom who has selflessly said that she is going to entrust her son into the care of those who have been waiting and praying for a son for years. And so we prayed for her and we prayed for this adoptive family and we prayed for this little boy that we as a church family will get to surround with God's grace and God's love. At the conclusion of the service, and I took one of the blankets, one of the blankets that our prayer shawl ministry has made. A group of introverts, by the way. Yes. (laughs) And we told the story of how Babies in this church, when they're baptized, are wrapped in a blanket. And we offered her, the birth mom, a blanket made by this church family. And explained to her that she would always be wrapped in God's grace and God's love. And that we were making a commitment to always wrap her child in that grace and that love as well. And that she would always be welcome and have a home here at Grace Avenue. Y'all, a lot of judgments could have been made about this situation and probably have been for all of those involved months before now. Struggles and pain and suffering, fear, and yet what was chosen on Saturday morning was love. Pure love, understanding that God's grace and God's table is much bigger than we can ever imagine. 
It was a blessing for us, but I need you to know that you are part of the reason that blessing was able to happen. A whole different look yesterday morning about um, we. And it was nice yesterday morning to have some people that we've never met that we realized um, may have been strangers, but now are part of the we that we consider to be the blessing in the kingdom of God. You want to pray? Sure. Go ahead. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we feel your presence in this place. In the midst of our questions, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst, oh God, of us being uncertain sometimes how to live in love with our neighbors. God, you are with us. And so, God, just as you have loved us, may we open ourselves to reach out in that love, seeking to be patient and to be kind, seeking not to be arrogant or boastful, seeking not to insist on our own way, but seeking, oh God, to allow your love, your love to never end. It is in Christ's name that we pray and that we let the conversation continue. Amen.